This is CBC Here and Now. I just felt it was really out of place. It was, uh, it didn't fit with the whole women's leadership. Why are we listening to a man? I think that might have been a bit of a learning um, moment for government uh, about knowing your audience. And I apologize going for going forward with this. The province hosts a women's leadership conference. But those attending say it missed the mark. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. A women's leadership conference in St. John's is accused of being tone deaf. Yes, the conference put off by the province is being ridiculed for the advice given to women. Here and Now's Katie Breen joins us now in studio. So Katie, what happened? Well, at a women's conference, a man came with a controversial message. His presentation came with Dale Carnegie's Golden Book, which told women in attendance to pray if they're worried and smile to make friends. Archaic 1950s advice that horrified the women I spoke with today. The conference started out with an announcement. That this is truly one of the highlights of my career. The Women's Policy Office is now the Office for the Status of Women. And with that name change, government says, comes a better defined department focused on preventing gender-based violence, advancing women in leadership, and making sure government uses gender-based analysis in its work. Today, the province says there will be more people hired on to work with the department, and government employees will receive training. We've always had a, a gender-based lens, but we want to do better, and we know there's room for impro improvement. Including at today's conference. Attendees I spoke with today said the idea for the conference was great. Nearly 400 powerful women in one room. It was the execution that was the issue. There was so much knowledge and wisdom and experience in the room. Why is that guy up there on the stage for over an hour? And I think we got a total of three minutes networking time when uh, all of us were kind of just aching to, to talk and to share. Attendees took issue with one presenter in particular, a man preaching the late Dale Carnegie's Golden Book approach. Protect your health and appearance by relaxing at home, it suggests. Don't worry about insomnia. Create happiness for others and smile. This is based on um, a kind of sexist way that the world was seen a long time ago and it probably worked in those in those times but now with you know the, the awareness of uh, women's role in society and all the equality issues that we talk about and all the cultural issues that we talk about um, it's a different it is very different government is now apologizing for having the speaker in it says the yellow book of advice isn't government material and the department will make changes for the next conference we have reached out to females for this session. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, get anyone available, the ones that we were looking at. So, uh, yeah, next time we will look uh, a little further, I guess. And I apologize going f for going forward with this, but uh, like I said, we will uh, make changes in the future. So, this book wasn't a hit, but the conference could have been. Attendees hope things improve next year, and in the meantime, they say women will continue to work off their own modern-day manual. Reporting live, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, now to the Muskrat Falls inquiry and today's testimony from former politician Derek Daly. The inquiry is looking into how the hydroelectric development has become so expensive and why it's so far off schedule. Daly was a senior cabinet minister in the Tory government when the project was given final approval and at one point he was the natural resources minister. After a day of questions from lawyers, Daly faced some pointed questions from inquiry commissioner Richard LeBlanc. Uh, when a government makes a decision, uh, who is responsible for that decision? Government. Right. So when you say government, is it the people who actually decide to make a decision? For instance, Churchill Fall or uh, Muskrat Falls. Like your cabinet, your government, basically decided to proceed with Muskrat Falls. So I assume that there was an understanding that the responsibility for Muskrat Falls f fell to the government of the day. And there was a responsibility to ensure that the, that, the pro that the project actually was done as a least cost to the, to the province. Mm -hmm. Right. So 
the responsibility then is with with the gov with the government of the day. Yet, um, and I know it's necessary to rely on other people, whether it be in, within Nalcor or your civil service or whatever the situation is. But ultimately, if and I'm, I'm saying this at this stage of the game, if it is established that you weren't getting everything you should have been getting, whose responsibility was that? That's a tough question. I guess uh, ultimately you'll decide, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's a fair question from a government perspective. I mean, we went through uh, two elections from a you know, democracy point of view. We went through two elections uh, on a Muskrat Falls mandate. Uh, the people of the province overwhelmingly supported that mandate. Uh, we moved forward with the project. Uh, we had information put before us where we made a decision that we felt was in the best interest of the people of the province. Um, ultimately, in the end, um, some of that information appears to have changed. Um, it may obviously impact the project. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess we have to take some responsibility. Uh, having made the decision and went to the people of the province to support us to do it. Um, beyond that, I think there's a, a, a level of responsibility, but there's also a level of accountability as well with respect to those people who were responsible to provide with us and uh, tasked to deliver to us uh, the information that we needed. Um, you know, from a government perspective, politicians in general, they have various backgrounds, various expertise, various levels of education. Uh, these are the people in our democracy that are tasked with making the big decisions uh, and, and carrying that responsibility. Uh, but understanding, uh, as I alluded to today, um, you know, we, we can have, in my view, the inquiry and, and drill down into uh, Muskrat Falls and which what we're doing and we're, we're finding out a lot of things. We're finding out as well a tremendous, tremendous amount of work where good work was done and put us in a position. Uh, but beyond that, there's a thousand things going on in government at the same time. And I think that's when I sit back as a former politician. Um, you know, again, the comment we did the best we could of what we had. Uh, does that negate responsibility? Not my intent. Uh, you know, I accept that we made that decision and we believed it was, be it was right. Uh, if it turns out that it's not, then you live with it. Uh, but if it turns out in the end, we'll be very satisfied. Well, switching gears now for a quick look at the weather forecast. Lots of watches and warnings still in place right across the province. Basically, driving conditions along the coastline for the island, along the south and up along uh, the west coast, northern peninsula, terrible. You'll want to stay off the roads tonight. High winds, lots of snow blowing around. We have a wind warning in place for the south coast and for the northeast coast. Bonavista, Bonavista, Northern Bay of Exploits, that's for tonight. Things should start to ease uh, tomorrow. We have a snow squall watch in place for the Bay St. George area. As for snowfall totals for this winter storm warning in place for uh, Corner Brook up through Parsons Pond, looking at uh, a total of 15, 10 to 15 centimeters for areas along the coast like the Corner Brook area, but in the upper terrain up in the mountains could see upwards of 50 centimeters of snow by the time the system starts to move off tomorrow. For Labrador, we still have lots of warnings in place there as well. We have a wind warning in the Norman uh, Lodge Bay area uh, for tonight. Winds gusting up to 100 kilometers an hour and uh, more snow coming. Not a whole lot for the coastline, about five centimeters of snow coming uh, for the McCovic and uh, Hopedale, Nain area uh, could see upwards of 30 centimeters in higher elevation. So lots to talk about still, but things are looking up. I'll talk more about that later. Anthony. Thanks, Carol. Well, the jury at Al Potter's trial finished hearing evidence today, and now they're going to have to wait until next week. That's when they will decide the 55 year old's fate. The day began and ended with Potter himself actually at the stand once again, as the Crown worked to try to poke holes into his story as well as his credibility. Now, in other news, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould broke her silence today. Oh, sorry, over here. 
Uh, Jody wilson Rabel broke her silence today. The former Justice Minister and Attorney General testified this afternoon before the House of Commons Justice Committee. It was all about the SNC-Lavalin affair. Here's some of her testimony. For a period of approximately four months between September and December of 2018, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the Attorney General of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC-Lavalin. These events involved 11 people, excluding myself and my political staff. From the Prime Minister's office, the Privy Council office, and the office... Now we have full coverage of Wilson Raybould's testimony at cbc.ca slash news. All right, uh, in terms of other stories right now, as uh, we've been saying today, it um, was... Uh, just trying to figure out where it is we're supposed to go right now. A uh, big story, of course, today happened in Washington. As you know, there was all kinds of discussions in terms of what happened with Donald Trump and his uh, lawyer, Michael Cohen. It was uh, quite the day in Washington, as you can imagine. And um, we actually have some of the coverage from what happened today. It was, uh, it was an incredible day, as you can imagine. Uh, there was a lot of testimony, and a lot of it was not flattering at all. Mr. Trump is a con man. He asked me to pay off an adult film star with whom he had an affair and to lie about it to his wife, which I did.
forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Yeah, so we have a story. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, a few gremlins decided to infest the studio tonight, but we think we've got everything under control now. Nor the weather under control. Get there in a second. Yeah. But. But. Wanted to give a little update on mm -hmm. uh, anyone who watches the show regularly m might know that I love honeybees and that it's I'm now a beekeeper. Yeah. So I just wanted to give a little update on the situation. Just have a look. Yeah, right, Carol, so we're going to take a look in closer here now and see how they're doing. That's uh, the voice and, of Paul uh, uh, Din of Adelaide's and uh, this was this afternoon the weather has been so cold lately oh, right. and he just popped by the house this afternoon right just to have a look to see how uh, the ladies right. they're all female how they're all doing inside they're the hive and I think sugar. that insulation has an R factor of uh, five or six <laughs> well they keep great. themselves warm by vibrating their wings but you can see them uh, eating the sugar we put some sugar cakes in oh, there a okay. while back because it's so cold outside right now we can't open up the hive to see what their honey stores are like right because it would you know hurt the bees so we don't know how much honey is in there so just in case they're hungry uh, Paul came by with some sugar so it looks like they're uh, yeah, they're they're munching on it there. Now we wouldn't do that in the spring or summer because mm -hmm. we wouldn't want sugar in the honey, because uh, honey, of course, is nectar. Right, of but, course. Uh, for the winter, of course, Professor <laughs> Stokes. I knew that. It's good to have a little bit of fur on them. Yeah, yeah, they're they're actually kind of cute when you look up close at them. <laughs> You're gonna get your own show. For this. That's I love great. the bees, so they're doing great. Yeah, and spring is only uh, yeah, never mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's still ways. They'll off. be a pollinating. Yeah. Eventually. The crocuses. Yeah. <laughs> So what are we looking at now? Well, there's still lots of warnings in uh -huh. place, and uh, it's thanks to this system that's uh, off the coast that's really affecting uh, everybody in the province. Uh, low pressure system, it's weakening though, so it's uh, sort of heading towards uh, the province, then it's going to start to to move away. You can see that swirling uh, mass there affecting Labrador and the island. Uh, lots of snow and blowing snow on the west coast. Quick, quickly going to go through these warnings uh, once again. We have uh, a wind warning for the south coast and the northeast coast and up on the eastern portion of the northern peninsula. Winter storm warning in place for Cornerbrook up through Parsons Pond. Uh, could see uh, upwards of 50 centimeters of snow over higher ele elevations, so that's between tonight and tomorrow, but uh, if you're along the coast, shouldn't see quite uh, that much snow. And for Labrador, we're looking at this winter storm warning uh, in place for the Rigolette uh, area and uh, blizzard warning for uh, Hopedale down through uh, Cartwright. So some more snow to come, some high, high winds, uh, terrible driving conditions in that area, but things are going to start to ease uh, tomorrow. Winds are going to stay strong in the morning in those areas, but then as we get into the afternoon, it should start to ease off. So this is the situation right now. You can see the snow on the west coast and up along coastal Labrador playing it out throughout uh, the evening tonight. That snow will stick around, causing you know, more snow in the higher ele elevations, as I mentioned. So overnight tonight, we're looking at a very cold wind chill as well. So it's going to be windy for pretty much everyone. And that wind is going to be super cold. So we have minus 24 wind chill for uh, the northeast coast area tonight. Going to be cold in St. John's as well. An overnight low of minus nine, two to four centimeters expected for the Marystown area. And uh, wind's not super, super strong uh, for the Cornerbrook area. Gusts up to 70. But uh, if you're around the Port of Basque area, things are going to be super windy down there with uh, gusts up to 100. So moving up to Labrador, very cold once again overnight tonight in Labrador City, looking at a wind chill of uh, minus 39 tonight. So I believe it was the same thing last night. So staying very, very cold. An additional 10 centimeters of snow to come in the McCovic area. Wind staying very strong uh, there as well tonight. But now tomorrow, things will start to ease off, as I mentioned, as we get into 
into the afternoon. Things looking fairly clear for much of the island, mostly a mix of sun and cloud, but the winds are going to stay fairly strong on the island. But uh, lots of flurry action in Labrador. Wind chill tomorrow, though, minus 16. So even though it's going to be minus 5, minus 3 uh, in Fairyland, uh, it's going to feel like minus 16 tomorrow. And we have some high winds along with that. So westerly winds gusting up to 80. So cold, strong winds tomorrow. But it's going to be mostly a mix of sun and cloud. Similar story for central areas. Grand Falls, Windsor and Gander. A chance of some flurries for the Harbor Breton area on the west coast. Wind chill there even colder. Minus 25 during the day tomorrow. Winds will start to ease though. Gusting up to 50 from the west and a little bit more snow to come for the Corner Brook Gross Morn area in the Straits. Looking at a chance of some flurries uh, tomorrow as well. Winds staying fairly strong there. About another two to four centimeters for the Cartwright area tomorrow for Labrador City. Wind chill staying very cold. Minus 28 tomorrow. Some morning winds will give way uh, in the afternoon, so it'll start to ease. But another 10 to 20 centimeters of snow coming for the Makovic area. So as I mentioned, things are getting better. I'll get into those details later. A lot of pipes still thawing out after the recent cold snap and people can sometimes find inventive ways to get the water flowing again, but not all of those ways are incredibly safe. I met up with Fire Prevention Officer Mike Marr at the central station of the St. John's Regional Fire Department. Well, Captain, a lot of cold lately. How does that affect uh, what you do? Well, Anthony, uh, you know, with, with these severe temperatures, a lot of the citizens will look for secondary sources of heat. But to, due to the long stretch of severe temperatures we have had, uh, the potential is greatly increased for, you know, freezing of pipes in the home. Right. Now, obviously, uh, here in town, unlike Labrador, we're not really used to having that many days one after the other. We're so cold. Uh, plumbers in St. John's, flat out. How about you guys and, and people trying to deal with their pipes? Well, I can confirm uh, in the month of February, this department responded to 16 uh, structure fires. Uh, the origin of two of those 16 calls was from the thawing of frozen pipes. Okay. Uh, I know you can't talk about specific cases. Correct. Yeah. But I'm sure over the years you've seen people do certain things. Um, what shouldn't you use to thaw your pipes? First and foremost, very important, no open flame device at all. Blowtorch? Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a double double whammy effect there in that uh, there's a potential for, for fire hazard in addition to accumulation of carbon monoxide Okay, with the, the gases, right? Correct. And I guess the other problem is if you end up causing a fire in your house, you've got no water. Right. So how do you, how do you fight it? Well, if you're going, you know, what we, what we advise people to do, if they're going to make any attempt to de any of their pipes, use a certified electrical heat tape, okay? Uh, or they can use a hair dryer right. and they can apply heat to the area of, of the affected area or put it on, you know, the heat directly onto the pipe. Should it be problematic in getting at the affected area or they, you know, they don't know exactly where, you know, it's problematic area is. Yeah, so you mean inside an insulation behind a wall? That correct, kind of, yeah. correct. They're, they're uh, you know, better off calling a licensed plumber. Uh, if you can find one. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, another good, uh, you know, a good thing to remember, they can leave the cupboard doors, you know, of any uh, kitchen cabinets or bathroom cabinets, cabinets open. The uh, warm temperatures in the house can get in around the plumbing. Uh, you know, if you're going to do that, any chemicals in the cabinet areas, make sure you keep them out of the reach of young children. All right, some good advice for a very cold time of the year. Winter's only got what? Five, six months left. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kindly welcome. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good Thanks. day. All right, now back to the jury at the Al Potter trial. It's finished hearing evidence earlier today, and now they'll wait until next week when they will decide the 55 year old's fate. And the day started and ended with Potter himself on the stand as the Crown worked to poke holes in his story and his credibility. Sheldon Steves wanted to know why did Potter stab Dale Porter 17 times if it was merely in self-defense? And he pointed out that Potter himself touted his martial arts background as well as his ability to block attackers. Potter says Dale Porter was strong and he couldn't get away. He also told the court today that this knife 
was Porter's. It was discovered in a body of water in Brigus, but the Crown suggested that Potter or somebody working for him planted that knife and that the whole story of two knives and self-defense was fabricated after Potter confessed to undercover police. The jury will now get a break until Monday when they'll hear final arguments and get instructions from the judge. Well, this is Pink Shirt Day in many schools in the province. Pink shirts are worn to promote not tolerating bullying. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Indian River High School in Springdale. And this is a sea of pink. There you go. <laughs> from Holy Spirit High School in Conception Bay South. Mm -hmm. And you got a photo there as well from Gill Memorial Academy in Musgrave Harbor. And we'll bring you some more photos from schools around the province a little later on Here and Now. By the time she was 12, she had three major heart surgeries under her belt. And then when she turned just 16, Rebecca Norman had another big surgery. She got a device implanted inside her to help her heart pump her blood. It's called an LVAD or a left ventricular assist device. And it connects to her heart and a cord that comes out through her abdomen. And that attaches to a controller and batteries that she keeps on her at all times inside her purse. Well, she spoke to CBC News back in 2010 
just a few months after she got that device. And tonight, in the next segment of our special series, This Is My Story, we're checking back in with her to find out how things are going. But first, here's what life was like for her when she was still back in high school. Have a look. Even a step from a valve transplant to this is way different because this is outside and I have to deal with this. I had to look at it every day. But whereas before it was inside and it was just, I didn't have to deal with it. I am a really positive thinker. And I am because I don't want to think, oh no, that's not going to happen or that's not going to work. Like I want to think happy because if not, I'm just going to be down. So that was Rebecca Norman when she spoke to CBC News. That was almost a decade ago. And here's what life is like for her today in this next segment of This Is My Story. I remember being very afraid. I tried to run away at one point. It was very, very hard to go through. I'm still not completely over it. My name's Rebecca and I had an LVAD implanted when I was just 16 years old. And this is my story. Baking cookies is just another Christmas tradition at the Norman household. But unlike most teenagers, Rebecca Norman was diagnosed with aortic valve stenosis prior to birth and that has meant countless tests and procedures, including three major heart surgeries. It's attached to two batteries. The latest operation gave Rebecca a portable device that helps her heart. The artificial heart is in the two sides of my heart, so it goes into the aorta and the left ventricle and there's kind of like a rotor, so it spins the blood, so it helps the left side of my heart work, so it doesn't have to work as hard. So then that lowers the pressures in my lungs, which means I wouldn't have to get a heart and lung transplant, I would only really need to get the heart transplant. I remember being very afraid to get this procedure done. It's hard to be in Edmonton with nobody that you really know except for my parents. I tried to run away at one point. Um, I hid from the doctors. I locked myself in one of the bathrooms and there was tile ceiling, so I attempted to <laughs> get up there. Uh, it was a little bit silly, but at the time, it just felt like I needed to get out of there and that was like the only option, so I didn't make it. <laughs> A lot has happened since then. So I have had multiple occasions to go to Edmonton for different reasons. Mostly it's just checkups and stuff, but sometimes it's a bit more serious. I had my uh, artificial heart replaced a couple of years ago, so that was quite a big deal. The artificial heart is supposed to help me like, be able to do more activities live a normal life basically, um, but I find that I also have scoliosis and that affects with the pain and not being able to walk as far. Also, the bag that has my artificial heart in it is heavy, so that makes the back pain a little bit worse. So I have bad days and good days, like some days I can do a bit more and I have to take less uh, medication for like pain and stuff, but some days it's a lot worse and I can barely get out of bed. So it kind of depends on, on the day. Mostly stay home and relax with my animals. And like watch Netflix, I read a lot. And I am really into Sudoku books. I've gone through quite a few in the last year. So we got a greenhouse this year and my dad built a couple of raised beds so it would be easier so I wouldn't have to bend over and hurt my back a bit more. Um, so I have quite a few tomato plants and cucumbers and all different kinds. And then I also grew 
some pumpkins, which were really exciting because then I ha had my own pumpkin to carve this, this fall. So I was really excited about that. I love to be out and really like get dirty, right in the dirt and like grow something. It's just, it's a good feeling. I wanted to go to medical school, but of course that's like a quite a big deal and a lot of work and you'd have to have long days and I can't really handle that at this point in my life. So I've been working uh, part-time as a pharmacy assistant. Being in the medical profession, kind of, like with pharmacy, it's at least a step in the right direction. Sometimes I have to fill the prescriptions myself and I'm out front and I deal with some customers, but most of the time I'm doing blister packs for the patients. It's good because I get to go in the back room and I get to sit down, which is a lot easier for me to handle. I love the people that I work with. They're so supportive and they're totally okay with me having to sit down if I need to, having to take a break whenever I need to. And even if I'm like last minute, can't come into work, they're fine. I do really enjoy what I'm doing right now, so it's good. A young person with what you would think is so much life to kind of lead and then you have to get this big surgery and it's so different and it's an adjustment so I would say just take it one day at a time and it it gets easier I didn't think it would and when you're stuck in it it really doesn't seem like it's gonna get better but it does Fantastic attitude. Now, on Twitter and social media, the reaction from here now, viewers to this series, has been fantastic. And in the final episode of This Is My Story, we're going to revisit Sydney Learning. Now, you might remember her from when Here and Now last spoke to her. It was a few years ago. She's a single mom. She lost her leg when she was just 15. And now she's about to graduate and start her career. So stay tuned for that story in just a few weeks. We did the best we could of what we had. Former Natural Resources Minister Derek Daly answers questions at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Why he put so much trust in Nalcor. Coming up.
Welcome back. So back to the Muskrat Falls inquiry now and who was watching now core as the project barreled ahead in 2013. That was the central question at the public inquiry in Labrador today. And once again, a former provincial cabinet minister said he wished he knew more about the cost of the project as it passed beyond the point of no return. Here now is Jacob Barker reports. As Minister of Natural Resources, Derek Daly was in charge of Nalcor and Daly said he trusted the Crown Corporation to make the best decisions for the Muskrat Falls project. We had a job to do, we had information, uh, we had established uh, a trust and a working relationship. We made decisions on the best information that we had and we felt that information was right. And you know, so from that perspective, that's how I feel. I guess that's how I sleep at night. Like former Premier Paul Davis, who testified yesterday, Daly said he's only learning now that cost overruns were evident in Alcor before the federal loan guarantee and that a risk report from 2012 said there was only a 3% chance of finishing the project on time. At the time, if there was a change in numbers, that would, should have been the numbers used and should have been the number that we put out publicly. In 2014, the PC government introduced a committee to oversee Nalcor after massive power outages. And as criticism of the project grew, Daly was asked repeatedly about oversight of Nalcor after the project began construction. And you uh, agree that there was no oversight of the project by government uh, during 2013 or, or from the time of uh, financial close until the Oversight Committee was established on March 14, 2014? No, I, I, I wouldn't agree there was no oversight. There, there's many forms of oversight, um, simply by engagement and discussion with NALCOR and um, the accountability that was built into NALCOR would signify some sort of oversight. Uh, so I, I wouldn't agree that there was no oversight. When questioned by the commissioner about whether it should be the government of the day that is ultimately the one who should bear responsibility of keeping the project to cost, Daly agreed, but he said his government did the best it could with the information it had. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, from provincial politics to federal ones now, Jody Wilson-Raybould broke her silence today. The former Justice Minister and Attorney General testified before the House of Commons Justice Committee this afternoon. It's all about the SNC-Lavalin affair. Here's some of her testimony. This same day, September 17th, I have my one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Prime Minister that I requested a couple of weeks ago. When I walked in, the Clerk of the Privy Council was in attendance as well. While the meeting was not about the issue of SNC and DPAs, the Prime Minister raised the issue immediately. The Prime Minister asked me to help out, to find a solution here for SNC, citing that if there is no DPA, there would be many jobs lost and that SNC would move from Montreal. In response, I explained to him the law and what I have the ability to do and not do under the Director of Public Prosecutions Act around issuing directives or assuming conduct of prosecutions. I told him that I had done my due diligence and had made up my mind on SNC and that I was not going to interfere with the decision of the, pro of the director. In response, the Prime Minister reiterated his concerns. I then explained how this came about and that I had received a Section 13 note from the DPP earlier in September and that I had considered the matter very closely. Further, I further stated that I was very clear on my role as the Attorney General and that I am not prepared to issue a directive in this case that it would not be appropriate. The Prime Minister again cited the potential loss of jobs and SNC moving. Then, to my surprise, the clerk stated or started to make the case for the need for a DPA. He said, quote, there is a board meeting on Thursday, September the 20th, with stockholders, end quote. Quote again, they will likely be moving to London if this happens, and there is an election in Quebec soon, end quote. At that point, the Prime Minister jumped in, stressing that there is an election in Quebec, and that, quote, I am an MP in Quebec, the member for Papineau, end quote. I was quite taken aback. My response, and I vividly remember this as well, was to ask the Prime Minister a direct question while looking him in the eye. I asked, quote, 
Are you politically interfering with my role, my decision as the Attorney General? I would strongly advise against it, end quote. The Prime Minister said, no, 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 we just need to find a solution. All right, uh, quite the day on Parliament Hill, and you can see full coverage of Wilson Raybould's testimony at cbc.ca slash news. And south of the border, Donald Trump's former personal lawyer faced tough questions before a congressional committee on Capitol Hill. Michael Cohen acted as a kind of fixer for Trump for more than a decade. Well, today he described himself as a fool and his former boss as a con man. Lindsay Duncombe has the details. Michael Cohen's testimony here today was revealing because of what he said about the president's character and because of the specific allegations that could have consequences for the future of Trump's presidency. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. Michael Cohen told Congress Donald Trump knew in advance that WikiLeaks would publish Democratic campaign emails stolen by Russia. He submitted this personal check, evidence, he says, that the president reimbursed him for hush money paid to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. He said Trump lied to a bank about his net worth when he tried to buy an NFL team. Cohen is going to jail, in part because he lied to Congress about plans to build a Trump Tower in Moscow during the campaign. Today, he said that testimony was edited and approved by White House lawyers. There were changes made um, additions, uh, Jay Sekulow for one. Republicans repeatedly questioned Cohen's credibility, painting the hearing as a democratic exercise to undermine the president. This debate in a member of Congress saying, I really didn't do anything wrong with the false bank things that, that I'm guilty of and going to prison for. You're a pathologi pathological liar. You wanted to work in the White House. No, you sir. You didn't get brought to the dance. Cohen was asked why he turned against the president. Watching the daily destruction of our civility to one another. Putting up silly things like this. Oh, that's silly. Really unbecoming of Congress. It's that sort of behavior. What we heard today isn't everything that Michael Cohen knows. He told Congress there are things he can't discuss because of ongoing investigations, including what he talked about with Donald Trump in their last conversation. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Well, as we've been saying today, it's Pink Shirt Day at schools to promote inclusion and to not tolerate bullying. These pictures are from Octagon Pond Elementary in Paradise. Mm-hmm. Busy day today in lots of schools. Yeah, and a sea of pink at St. Kevin's High School in the Goulds. There you go. And also a picture from uh, St. John's Bosco in Shea Heights uh, here in St. John's. There are photos from other schools across the province on Twitter. You can check out the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District's Twitter account for those. Stay with us. I'll have your weather forecast coming up next.
This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Get to the weather now, Carolyn. Uh, I'm sure that you know uh, about various equipment that's needed for skiing mm -hmm. because you're, you're a big skier, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of. <laughs> well, you know the you know the equipment, right? Yes, so I do. you need stuff like skis, right? Yes, mm -hmm. ski boots and a warm coat. Of there course. you go. Well, how about rubber boots, a salt beef bucket, and a big pillow? Just take a look at this. Aza is trying to get Sandra ready. She came up here in the storm, and she wants to go skiing. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but she got a pillow tied around her butt just in case she falls down and breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's Sandra Dirtle, uh, learning to ski on a makeshift pair of skis and other unusual pieces of equipment. Uh, most of us use poles. She's got oh. toilet plungers. Yeah. And that's her friend Eliza Swires helping her out. And of course, another good friend yeah. was uh, kind enough to get it all on camera. She left her, um, her caboose protector uh, all on camera, as you see. This is uh, from her friend's cabin in Hotterville. It's about 20 minutes outside of Bonavista. Oops. Oh. Is she okay? No. She's laughing. She is laughing. Now we were told Sandra, she was not. You okay? <laughs> get the whole body. Oh, right. The helmet's the beef bucket. Right. Yeah, there you go. Oh, kind of like uh, mummers on moguls. Uh, <laughs> That's now, good. thank you. It's on Facebook, and it's almost a quarter of a million views. Wow, since right? yesterday. So you see, if you want hundreds of thousands of fans, plungers, beef buckets, and, and no sense of shame or dignity, <laughs> and you'll be fine. <laughs> It's a great wow, video. that's a lot of people watching that. It's a lot. And more just saw it. Yep. So, anyway. Okay. Okay, so is now. It, is it good for plunger skiing <laughs> in the weather? <laughs> yeah, pretty good in okay. terms of uh, snow and stuff like that. So, it is pretty cold mm -hmm. uh, out there tonight. I'm going to start with a look at the wind chill right now in Labrador City. It's minus uh, 34 with the wind chill. Uh, so, that wind chill is going to be. Uh, getting even colder overnight tonight, so it feels like minus 17 in St. John's right now, minus 19 in Port of Basque, so it's going to be a very cold, windy night for pretty much everyone. We do have these warnings in place along the south coast, wind warning, northeast coast, and on the northern peninsula there. So high winds overnight tonight, terrible driving conditions, snow squall watch for the Bay St. George area, and winter storm warning for uh, much of the west coast as well. So for Labrador, once again, we do have the blizzard warning in place going to be really nasty along the coast uh, overnight tonight. Things should start to ease off by tomorrow afternoon, but uh, we're looking at minus five as the high in St. John's tomorrow could see a couple of light flurries, but mostly a mix of sun and cloud. The winds are going to stay very strong uh, in the east and along the northeast coast gusts up to 80 winds from the west, so it's going to be a blustery uh, day for sure, as well as in the Port of Basque er Burgio area minus 11 as the high there tomorrow and a little bit more snow coming for the gross morn area tomorrow as well. So as we head into Labrador, more snow for McCovic tomorrow. The winds will be strong in the morning, but in the afternoon, as I said, should start to ease off minus 18 as the high in Lab City tomorrow. Not a whole lot of snow uh, coming there and the winds should stay fairly light uh, in western Labrador. So looking ahead to Friday and we're into the weekend. Uh, things are clearing on the island. It's going to stay a little bit breezy and uh, could see a few flurries there on the west coast and as well in Labrador as we head into Friday afternoon. Uh, but things are pretty clear for much of the island. A mix of sun and cloud, a little bit cloudier in the Marystown area. Temperatures on the island on Friday between minus 10 and minus 5 uh, there. So, but Things should stay fairly uh, windy, not as windy as they have been, though. Uh, for Labrador, minus 16 in Lab City on Friday, and uh, chance of some flurries there as we head into the weekend for coastal areas. So for Friday night into Saturday, this is how it's going to play out. A few more flurries for Labrador and as well for the West Coast. Things staying fairly clear for the East and Central with a bit of cloud cover there, and it should stay fairly breezy, but not too, too bad, not as bad as it 
as it's been for sure. So this is the five day outlook. We're getting into some flurries there on Sunday, but temperatures in the minus five, minus three range up until Monday. Some cloudy skies uh, there for central areas for uh, Saturday, a mix of sun and cloud, but then those flurries could move in on Sunday and clearing off there on Monday for the West Coast on the weekend. Chance of a scattered flurry on Saturday and continuing on into Sunday and Monday. Temperatures not too bad there as we get into Labrador, uh, looking at some sunshine on Sunday and a few more flurries on Monday. And for Western Labrador, cloudy with flurries on Sunday. Temperatures much cooler, staying very cold actually uh, for the rest of the week as we get into Monday. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. Not surprising given what Carolyn just told you. Marine Atlantic expects this latest round of ferry cancellations to last at least into tomorrow evening. High winds are battering both sides of the Cabot Strait, forcing the company to cancel its crossing for the fourth straight day this morning. Gary Mansfield has more now from North Sydney. Trucks continue to roll in the gate at Marine Atlantic in North Sydney as high winds and rough seas keep ferries at a standstill. Mother Nature, we're, we're certainly at our mercy right now. In North Sydney right now, we have approximately 225 commercial trucks. In Port of Basque, there's about 130. So. As a backlog of commercial traffic builds up on both sides of the strait, Marine Atlantic is hoping for a break in the forecast. And we need to get a stretch of weather where we can allow numerous crossings to take place to, to move that traffic because as we move the traffic, there will be more arriving at the terminal. So with a four-day shutdown, it certainly had an impact and uh, we need to get that cleared up as quickly as we can, but uh, we won't do it until the uh, weather conditions will allow. As Marine Atlantic waits for better weather, local business owners cash in on the stranded truckers. We actually see them for dinner and then they're back again for supper, the same crew, so <laughs> that's, that's good. Ferry delays is a booming business for restaurants in North Sydney. Bernice McMahon says a storm or two are always welcome. We see lots of truckers, so it's uh, good for us when, when the ships aren't running, but bad for them, but it is definitely good for business. Back at the terminal, trucks are lining up for the next crossing. Since last April, Marine Atlantic has canceled 166 runs, six more than all of the last fiscal year, and there's an entire month left to go. Daryl Mercer says getting the traffic moving is a huge concern. The biggest impact that we see, especially in Newfoundland, are products such as fruits, vegetables, meats, chicken, those types of products moving into the grocery stores. So shelves start to, uh, start to go empty. Mercer says they're hoping the wind will die down within 24 hours. But if not, Thursday night's crossing could also be in jeopardy. Gary Mansfield, CBC News, North Sydney.
back. Just enough time to have a look at our gorgeous viewer photo of the day. This was taken today. So wow. if you're wondering about the weather along uh, the south coast, which is where this was yeah. taken on the Avalon in Cape Race. Oh, that's what it looked like down there today. I was going to say, you know, it looks almost black and white, but you can see by the top of the lighthouse that it's not a black and white photo. What a no. gorgeous picture. Great. Yeah. Clifford Dorn, thank you so much for sending this in. And if you have a photo, please email it to us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. I hope, Clifford, that the lens is making it look like you're that close mm -hmm. and that you weren't that close. No. Great picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're going to go and kill every gremlin in the studio. <laughs> and uh, you got rough, the hammer. We got through it. It's and, all good. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> good night, everyone.